Thank you for your patience. Uh, the only thing standing between cocktails and us is this panel. Um, not that I'm trying to rush anybody. But um, what I wanted to do, and we're very, very grateful to have uh, Danny Weitzner from NTIA, Office of Policy Analysis and Development here. Uh, Danny um, is a go the godfather of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. He wrote, literally wrote the charter uh, for our organization with Jerry Berman back uh, in 1996. Um, we would not exist if it were not for Danny and Jerry, um, and we are in, in his debt for, for existing. Um, Danny uh, is, works at NTIA in, the, in his past. Um, he was chief scientist at, at the World Wide Web Consortium and developed a variety of different tools like P3P, um, PICS, um, all, all the different uh, privacy enhancing initiatives and, and, and standard settings at the World Wide Web Consortium. Um, before that, he was at the Center for Democracy and Technology uh, with Jerry Berman. So uh, we are honored to have uh, Danny here today to kind of give us, set the table for consumer protection. Whose job is it? Danny? Thank you all. For the record, Lori Craner developed P3P. I just made her life difficult while she was doing it. Uh, um, so the, the truth of the matter is that, that the whole internet community is really in Tim's debt and in the debt of the Congressional Inter Caucus Advisory Committee for, for providing such an uh, important and enduring forum. Uh, um, a lot of the, 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 the half-life, as you know, of, of startups is uh, pretty short. And, um, Tim took this organization um, uh, as a startup, as a kind of a, uh, a sort of a goofy idea, and um, and really made it an important part of the landscape. So thank you, Tim. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk uh, just very quickly about some of the work that's going on at the Commerce Department on privacy. By by happenstance, uh, uh, this is an auspicious day for us. Uh, uh, today, Secretary Locke uh, announced a notice of inquiry uh, that, that we've just released uh, uh, this morning on information privacy and innovation in the internet economy. Uh, and I want to talk very quickly about uh, the goals that we have for this effort, uh, the, the kinds of questions that we're going to be asking all of you, uh, uh, and where we think we're going to go from here. And then I'll look forward to uh, sitting on the panel and listening. Um, our, our goal in launching this, this inquiry uh, is really to identify a forward-looking uh, approach to the interaction between privacy and innovation in, in the information economy. I, I think it, it kind of goes without saying uh, that it's important to get uh, privacy rules right uh, in this environment. There's, uh, um, and I think we're at, a, at an auspicious moment in the history of the Internet where we've actually got uh, a fair amount of history to look back on. We have uh, upwards of 15 years of work uh, at the Federal Trade Commission that's been ongoing in, in addressing uh, consumer protection issues online, particularly privacy issues. And I think it's a great time <clears throat> uh, to have a look at, at how that effort has gone. Uh, we're working very closely uh, with the FTC uh, on, on their rethinking uh, uh, and, and, and evaluation of their privacy work. Uh, and, and I think it's part of uh, really a larger effort that's going on all around the world, a larger rethinking of the, of the, the privacy landscape. As, as those of you who follow this issue know, uh, the European Union uh, uh, is required by, by their own procedures to, to refresh uh, the European Union Data Protection Directive. That's obviously a very important uh, benchmark in the, in the global privacy landscape. Uh, 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 lots of people on the Hill, not the least of, of whom Chairman Boucher are looking very hard at this question and, and um, everyone's eagerly awaiting uh, their thoughts on, on how to move forward here. Uh, our colleagues at the FTC are going to come out with a report on where to go uh, with online privacy. Um, and um, it's, it's our responsibility uh, on behalf of the administration to have a look at this environment uh, and really try to uh, ask a set of questions that will help us set out uh, an approach to privacy issues, a set of principles that can guide this administration's effort uh, uh, in the years to come. Uh, as I said, because of the fact that there's so much rethinking going on, we think it's an especially important moment uh, uh, to try to frame a perspective, uh, uh, frame a strategy, uh, and move forward both, both domestically and, and globally. Because, uh, of course, on the, in the Internet environment, it's, it's hard to separate those two. Uh, I'll give you just a tiny bit of a preview of the kinds of questions that we're asking. 
uh, in our NOI. It's up on the NTIA website today. It'll be published in the Federal Register, I think, by the end of the week. Uh, and there's a period of about 45 days during which uh, we'll be looking for, for comments. We're, of course, also happy to chat with anyone who wants to come and talk with us uh, about these issues. Uh, the kinds of questions that we're going to be asking are going to be, uh, for example, to be taking a look at uh, what was a kind of a delicate uh, balance between uh, uh, substantial reliance on self-regulation in the consumer privacy space uh, uh, along with uh, a kind of a backdrop of, of general uh, Federal Trade Commission Section 5 uh, enforcement authority. Uh, we're very interested in uh, both consumer and, and commercial comment on how that's going. Do we have the, do we have the right balance there? Is that, is that a way to go forward? Um, lots of questions emerge these days about whether the notice and choice framework that was a key part of the, 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 the FTC's privacy framework over the last uh, uh, period of, of years, um, uh, whether that notice and choice framework is still the right way to go forward. Lots of good questions get raised about whether consumers are able to make informed choices, uh, uh, and equally good questions are raised about uh, what we would do if we didn't rely on consumers, uh, if we couldn't expect consumers to make informed, intelligent choices. Uh, we're especially interested in the evolution of privacy rules domestically and globally, as I said, uh, uh, certainly in the, the process for the Commerce Department that led up to the framing of this notice of inquiry. Uh, we've heard from uh, a large number of U.S. companies about the complexity of, of, of offering uh, Internet web-based services uh, around the world uh, in, a, in a diversity of, of, of privacy regimes. Uh, we're very interested in the impact uh, on U.S. business, particularly in this, in this especially innovative uh, uh, segment of the U.S. economy. So um, uh, we've now done what I think is the easy part. We've asked a whole bunch of questions. Uh, we're going to expect very intelligent answers from all of you. Uh, uh, and and uh, from there, over the course of the summer, we'll be looking at all those responses, uh, compiling a report. Uh, that we hope will, that we expect will contribute uh, to the overall administration process of, of developing uh, um, principles and a strategic direction on privacy going forward. So uh, with that, um, I'll thank Tim again for giving us the chance to uh, come out here and we'll look forward to lots of good responses from you to our notice of inquiry. So thanks very much. Danny's going to take his placard down to the end of the table and, and have a seat. Thanks, Danny, for uh, setting up that, that um, discussion about uh, privacy um, rules. Um, my name is Grant Gross. I'm a reporter for a bunch of tech magazines and websites, including PC World and Computer World. I've been asked to kind of moderate this panel, and uh, I'm going to try to get to the questions quick and, and limit my, my conversation. Um, um, we, uh, when we were talking about setting up this panel, there's, there's several kind of issues relating to consumer protection and mobile um, networks that have been kind of bubbling up through the years. We have kind of questions that, that have been around for a while, like roaming and early termination fees. But then we have questions of net neutrality um, that have been um, hotly debated in the last couple of years. We ha have um, questions about uh, mobile providers blocking text messaging campaigns, and there's been a couple of examples of things happening in that regard. Um, th we also have um, some concerns coming up about uh, proposed new rulemaking authority at the uh, Federal Trade Commission and how that might impact um, both the Internet overall and, and mobile Internet providers. Um, and several other questions as well. Um, just to get started here, I'm going to ask to go down the line, have people introduce themselves, and ask a couple questions for them to kind of expound on a little bit. Um, is there a need for more consumer protection rules, uh, particularly in the mobile um, internet space? And if so, um, who is the best agency uh, authority to, to address those things? So go ahead, Steve. Thanks, Grant. Steve DelBianco, I'm executive director of NetChoice, coalition of e-commerce and online service companies. That it's all about promoting e-commerce and online. And a large part of that is promoting trust and confidence of, of users. And uh, that may be trust and confidence to make sure you're not going to be defrauded or deceived when you're doing an online e-commerce 
or using a service that might uh, not honor its privacy policy. But it's also, in keeping with the theme that Tim had set up for today, it's also making sure your children are not going to be exposed to really um, unsafe conditions or significant risks from a, from a child predator or something when they're using an online playground as opposed to the playground down the street. So as, as for the questions that, that Grant teed up, I noticed that the panel was called Whose Job Is It? And I think Tim had a sort of an intentional typographical. It doesn't say W-H-O-S-E, it's W-H-O apostrophe S. And so I, I get it, because I think my answer to, to whose job is it is, well, I know who's, well, who's on first, and the FTC is on second. And that's a good thing, because the FCC just got picked off at third. <laughs> and I think that answer will make a lot more sense when we explore the rest of the questions, because I do believe that pickoff a pickoff of the FCC at third does mean that it's important for the FTC to move on over and step into the breach and use the enforcement powers it has to see whether unfair and deceptive practices are really at the root of what the concerns could be that undermine trust and confidence, both in the broadband context, the Comcast case, but in other, other cases as well. But I look forward to everyone else's answers. Harold, go ahead. <clears throat> My name is Harold Feld. I'm legal director at public knowledge, and I apologize for um, infecting you all today with my head cold, but um, thank you for bearing with me. Um, I think that um, we certainly do need consumer protection um, in this industry. I would hope that we would take as a given that um, all uh, Americans should be entitled in the services that they use uh, to know where to go if they're having a problem. Um, the expectation that we will settle this all through class action suits or, um, you know, that the market will somehow work its magic uh, and everything will always turn out just fine um, is, uh, I think, uh, rather foolish and disproven by uh, um, history. Uh, I'm not sure I agree that the FCC has been, quote, picked off at third because the question is about what? Um, it is a fact that mobile carriers are for some purposes, carriers. <clears throat> Therefore, subject to the Federal Communications Commission uh, and explicitly exempted uh, from FTC authority. Uh, the questions here are challenging and complex. Privacy, for example, while traditionally thought of as an FTC uh, issue, um, it seems to me that if you are uh, asking things like you have a geolocation device that is mandated under an E911 rule, which is an FCC rule, um, is that adjunct to the carrier function? Does the FTC have uh, authority uh, over other incidental information that is picked up? Uh, and what about text messaging, which has not been classified at all? Uh, my own personal preference is to say that um, the uh, more consumer watchdogs we have out there, um, the healthier it is. Uh, I think that uh, uh, when we preempted consumer protection and cable, it turned out to be a disaster. Um, when we preempted consumer protection in the banking industry and decided we were just going to leave that to the federal government, that also turned out to be a disaster, as uh, people have discovered. Uh, that said, there needs to be a very clear understanding over where you go for what. Uh, there are some things that the FCC does quite well. Uh, there are some things that they do poorly and that the Federal Trade Commission um, is better suited to. And frankly, there are some things that uh, are better left to uh, local and state uh, agencies uh, who can handle uh, individual complaints uh, and do so all the time, even in the context of uh, um, national and international industries. Uh, Joel, ne next. Hi, thank you. My name is uh, Joel Kelsey. I'm a policy analyst with Consumers Union. We're the nonprofit publisher of Consumer Reports magazine. Um, and, and actually, I couldn't agree with Harold Moore. I think that um, the question of where to go for what is, is really the question that we should be exploring most. I, I don't know that it's necessarily the FCC has been picked off at third, but um, it's, it's more maybe and timely since it's playoff season that they got called for high sticking and they're in the penalty box for, for two minutes on some particular issues. Um, l let me offer maybe just kind of a quick framework through which we at CU tend to approach the wireless issues. Um, I think consumers are very excited to see the growth and leaps and bounds in the wireless industry. Um, certainly more consumers than ever before are subscribing 
to wireless service are buying handsets or buying advanced handsets. Um, but we don't confuse growth or innovation with competition. Um, we tend to look at uh, the number of market players that are in the market, the costs associated with, uh, with signing up for mobile service, and, um, and, and also the, the choice that consumers have when it comes to choosing carriers, when it comes to choosing handsets, uh, and what informs that choice and what kind of constricts that choice. So, and, and I think that we've kind of been looking at this for a while and seeing that as more Americans are cutting the cord and going from landline to wireless, exclusively in, some, in, in many instances, um, increasing costs are kind of reaching deeper and deeper into their pockets. And, and consumers are upset about that. Every year, the magazine Consumer Reports publishes in January are, are an issue of the state of, of the wireless marketplace in some, in some ways. And um, we go out and, and, and interview our subscribers, and it's, uh, in my knowledge, the largest survey of its kind that's done. And one in five of our subscribers have told us that the number one gripe they have with the wireless mobile marketplace is, is, is expense, is it's too expensive. Um, so, so let me, um, before we dig into privacy um, and, and some of these other issues, I'll, I'll just kind of offer th up three examples of, of provider conduct in the marketplace that, that paint, at least for me, a troubling picture um, of the market structure and, and also of consumer costs. The first is handset exclusivity, the inability of consumers to take their phone with them uh, as they go from one provider to another the inability of consumers to choose a wireless provider based on quality of service if they want to shop for a particular type of handset. Uh, in that same January survey, we found that 38% of consumers chose their provider based on the handset. Contrast that with 39% of subscribers that chose based on quality of service. If in this country we want to in incentivize carriers to build out if we want to incentivize new carriers to enter the market and lower those barriers to entry, and we want to build faster, more ubiquitous networks, I think it's a good idea to point the incentives in the marketplace towards network investment rather than signing exclusive contracts with the next coolest handset manufacturer in order to get consumers into your service and, and sticking with your service. Second is, is switching costs. Um, handset exclusivity is one of those switching costs. If you go from one provider to another, in some cases, and you have that phone, you turn it into a very expensive brick um, rather than being able to take your investment with you. The other switching costs, and we alerted to this, I think, at the beginning of the panel, is early termination fees. Um, ever rising and represent hundreds of dollars make no sense to consumers because they bear no relation to the cost of the handset that they're subsidized when they, when they sign up for service. If you're a consumer and you sign up for service, you get a break in the cost of the handset. That's great. I think a lot of consumers would choose to do that. I think a lot of consumers would choose to sign to your contracts in order to get that break in price, but it should be transparent. The terms and conditions should be there in front of consumers. They should know how much it's prorated over the cost of their contract, and it should actually bear some relation to the cost of that handset um, so that consumers aren't held into a service provider and, and unable to vote with their feet if they choose to switch providers based on quality of service. Um, we found, again, that 17% uh, of subscribers in the last year sought to change providers and decided not to because of early termination fees. And then the third and last before, before, um, before I, I shut up and pass the microphone along is, um, is fees for overages on both text messaging and data. Um, consumers are increasingly signing up for, uh, consumer, I think we're past the increasing part most consumers in this country sign up for data plans and sign up for, for text messaging plans. If you go over your text messaging plan in particular, you're paying 20 cents a pop per message to both send and receive. Again, uh, a number that bears, in, in our mind, no relation to cost, as the cost of actually providing those texts goes down. Um, and for data, depending on which carrier you're with, you're, you're paying per megabit or per kilobit um, exceedingly large costs. And we have more and more examples of consumers getting charged hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on their bill, their monthly bill, uh, for going over their data charges. Um, this is an area that, that I think it's right maybe for both agencies to look at with regard to truth and billing, truth and labeling, um, and, and also just uh, you know, stopping those kind of overages and helping, helping consumers, or at least helping providers explain to consumers how those, those pricing options are more related to cost. Um, so with that, I'll just, I'll just kind of pass it down. Jackie, for a bit different perspective. 
Hi, um, I'm Jackie McCarthy, and I'm the Director of State Regulatory Affairs at CTIA, the Wireless Association. Um, and to answer Grant's uh, uh, question, um, you know, we, we, I would definitely agree with, with Harold that uh, some sort of clarity about where consumers can go uh, for, for questions and concerns about consumer issues would benefit not only consumers, but, uh, but the providers who are operating um, you know, without regard to state boundaries and who are operating nationwide. Um, I, I will note the, the responsiveness uh, of our industry in terms of uh, pricing and, and service terms. Um, the, these, are, um, these are options that consumers are, are really are taking up as we see the advent of uh, more and more consumers adopting uh, non-contract and, and prepaid uh, service plans. And um, I would also note in terms of some, uh, some, some numbers from uh, the GAO late last year, um, about 84% of uh, respondents indicated that they were at least somewhat or very satisfied with their wireless service, uh, and that 90% uh, of wireless subscribers in this country have a choice of at least four facilities-based uh, carriers. Certainly, um, as the GAO's uh, report and as um, consumers report, consumer re reports um, data indicates, um, you know, there's, there's room for improvement uh, for um, for wireless consumer satisfaction, uh, but I think we uh, believe that uh, again a unified framework of, of consumer protection rules that are um, that are applicable across the country uh, and that are enforced uh, by the states would, uh, would would reflect the trend, would reflect the state of our marketplace, and would provide some clarity across the board. Danny, any any thoughts on those two questions? I'm a very poor sports fan, so I'm not going to comment on which base the FCC is <laughs> left on uh, or otherwise where they are in the field. Um, I think they're still there somewhere. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, just just one, one comment about uh, from the, the history of, of privacy, of online privacy regulation. I think it is important not only that consumers know where to go when they have concerns, but also that uh, frankly, that both advocates and the industry know where to go when they have concerns and, and need guidance or have, have issues that they want to raise. Um, I think that the, uh, w what, what we've seen over the last 10 or 15 years in the online privacy environment is a very delicately balanced um, uh, arrangement between uh, individual industry participants many well-behaved, some not well-behaved, uh, industry associations that try to round up uh, their members and participants in a kind of an organized way to behave in a, in a way that, that meets reasonable consumer expectations, uh, and, and regulators that try to look very carefully at how to use what are, in the end, pretty scarce enforcement resources to send the right kind of signals about what, what behavior is acceptable and what's not. Um, uh, some people have, have, over time, called that a self-regulatory process. That certainly describes part of the process, but not the whole process. Um, I think that what, what we understand about the, the internet and, and online environment in general is that we want to preserve uh, 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 the flexibility for, for innovation and growth and the development of new services. Uh, but we also, as, as, as just about everyone on the panel has said, as everyone on the panel has said, we have to make sure that consumers know where they can go and that we have a process for, for, for sorting out uh, uh, disputes and, and questions about expectations when, when they arise. Since it was brought up a couple of times here, let's talk about the FCC at third base. Um, um, as most of you know, there's a Comcast decision from the D.C. Court of Appeals um, early this month, correct? Was it early this month? I've been losing track of time. But um, what the the what the F, the uh, court said that was that the FCC in that specific case didn't have the the power to enforce net neutrality rules on um, Comcast, and there that raises some questions in some people's minds about the FCC's ability to to do a lot of different broadband regulations, and um, just wanted to ask if anybody had some more thoughts on whether that case, um, how it affects the FCC's ability to do all kinds of things with mobile broadband. Go ahead, whoever wants to go. Thanks. 
So when I, when I said uh, FTC on second, there is a way to move them into scoring position, right? They were, they were set up 100 years ago by President Wilson to cover unfair and deceptive trade practices and consumer protection in all forms of trade and commerce. It was agnostic about technology. And uh, if just on a whim, if the FTC were to take a run at third base and take a run at the BitTorrent case and Comcast, you know, what would they use, right? They, I guess they would use the unfairness principles they've got. And, I went to, to a, a sort of a religious publication by Howard Beals, who was the consumer protection chief in 2007. He wrote a piece called The FTC's Use of the Unfairness Authority, Its Rise, Fall, and Resurrection. That's the religious piece. So he had a three-part test in mind that the FTC would use to assess Comcast. And first he'd say, has there been a substantial consumer in injury? And I certainly hope there's more of a consumer injury other than Johnny just well, not being able to download a pirated movie from, from his cable. The second test of unfairness is, is the harm encountered there by Johnny, is it outweighed by countervailing benefits? And for that, they have to do an inquiry on what the benefits that other members of that cable network would have accrued if their performance was not degraded. So my, my Comcast telephone service worked fine because of the management that may have been happening with BitTorrent or my, uh, my other applications online. Third test of unfairness, would be, is the injury suffered by Johnny, the, the, the download of the movie, is that an injury that the consumer could have reasonably avoided? I, I don't know how that analysis will go, but Johnny certainly could have paid to rent or buy a DVD or a movie instead of bringing it down from BitTorrent. So I don't know how that'll go, but that unfairness authority has been used hundreds of times. In the Orkin case, long distance phone service and cramming, 200 times, according to Howard Beals, to stop things like internet uh, pop-up ads and related actions. And uh, that's a three-part test. Let's put it to use. I mean, Danny said, putting it to use, Danny said that there's our scarcity of enforcement resources at the FTC. And take that as a given. No, that's not a given. That's a choice. We have an agency that protects consumers, regardless of medium, and we need to choose to throw more resources into the enforcement area so that that agency can do what we need it to do. Um. So hard to know where to begin. <laughs> One and uh, whether whether to deal with the the Comcast, where I continue to be amazed and appalled about how this is characterized, especially since Comcast in 2008 filed with the FCC and said what they were doing, and they were very clear that they simply blocked this stuff regardless of network congestion condition, and they blocked it regardless <clears throat> of whether the content was legally or illegally obtained. And to continue to pretend that some fictional little Johnny is the only person who is injured as opposed to the actual real Rob Topolsky who was trying to upload stuff that he had a perfectly legal right to upload is just disingenuous or ignorant. Um, the uh, uh, Moving, however, to the mobile internet and why Comcast is to some degree irrelevant in this world. Section 303 sub R of the Communications Act gives the FCC the right to make whatever rules governing licenses that are in the public interest. This is a critical distinction between the Comcast case and how we regulate wireless. Furthermore, Section 32 um, says th that wireless carriers are carriers. They are common carriers with regard to particular services that they offer, starting with voice. Now, we've said that the broadband stuff that they have on there is an information service. But again, distinct from Comcast, the wireline cable company that was also offering an information service, there is the fact that Sprint, Verizon, everybody else who's offering wireless voice is a carrier under Title II, which changes the equation to some degree how you mix and parse what the differences are between the services. When you've got voice, text, and information service all bundled in one platform, sold as one unit, is a question the FCC has not resolved. In fact, the NPRM they issued today on roaming, I believe, 
keys off the question of how we're going to resolve those uh, issues. I have not seen the actual NPRM, but I can say in the 2007 order, they decided we're not going to classify text messaging, what type of service it is, but we decide, pursuant to our other sources of authority, that we're going to apply the roaming rules to text as well as to voice. So, you know, just as a matter of legal authority, the FCC is there for mobile in a way that it is or isn't for uh, uh, wireline services. Anyone else like to weigh in on that one? Sure. Um, so I, I'll start, I guess, with the Comcast decision and, and what the court actually said wasn't necessarily, maybe this is a nuanced view, but wasn't necessarily that the FCC didn't have the authority to, to make decisions regarding net neutrality or impose net neutrality rules or stop Comcast from blocking. What the court said was that the FCC's current theory of its jurisdiction over broadband networks needs to be related in, to an express delegation of congressional authority in the act. Um, and that the pieces of the act they cited weren't that, were not express delegations of congressional authority. Um, so, so that to me is a more nuanced reading um, and, and a better reading because I, I think it, it means that um, the goals of net neutrality are still important. Um, the goals of protecting, and, and let's be clear here, what the FCC was seeking to do wasn't trying to regulate the internet. It was trying to, um, under two Republican chairmen, preserve the right of consumers to make choices about what kinds of content they wanted to look at on the internet, lawful content. Um, and that's extremely important and has giant marketplace um, impacts. So, so, so let's just clear up that uh, uh, at the outset. Um, second is, um, before we turn to the mobile net, um, the issues, the, the relationship with that court's decision in broadband, I think, um, have, there's been lots, lots of people have talked about it in very hyperbolic ways about the FCC's ending its regime over broadband policy. Um, I, I don't necessarily look at it like that, but I do think it does, it, I do think it raises some very serious issues um, with regard to broadband in this country. The FCC in its national broadband plan for the first time, um, or, or maybe Congress for the first time in the Stimulus Act, said that broadband is no longer, or the federal government should no longer treat broadband like a commercial service akin to pay TV, but it's a universal service. It's a service that's important to this country's economic well-being, it's important to job growth, it's important to, uh, to international competitiveness, and it should be the policy or the framework or the lens of this country in policy making to approach it as such, to try to grow competition in local markets, to try to bring down price so that more consumers adopt broadband and more people get on, on, uh, on the internet. So, so, and they offered a number of different initiatives in order to do that. One is the Universal Service Fund, which is $8 billion every year, uh, being able to direct that towards broadband, the expansion of broadband. Uh, a second is truth in billing and transparency, just making bills more easily understood by consumers. Um, Third is public safety. I mean, it goes on and on and on. It's a great plan. You should all read it. Uh, all of those things are not within the auspices. Many of those things are not under the FTC's charter. Um, I agree that FTC has a very important role to play, particularly when it comes to online behavioral advertising, privacy protections, um, and, and making, it, making sure that bad actors aren't being unfair or deceptive when it comes to offering their products. But when it comes to the actual carrier, when it comes to the service provider of broadband or voice or information, um, I think there's a pretty clear and important role for the federal communications to play, and it has played that since 1934. When it comes to the mobile, the, the, the mobile space, um, Harold's absolutely right. The way that we look at mobile voice is as a common carrier. The way that we look at mobile data is as an information service. Um, I think it would be a disaster if consumers had to go to the FCC when they had a problem with the voice part of their cell phone bill and had to go to the FTC when they had a, a problem with the data part of their, of their, of their phone bill. This is a service that, that consumers buy uh, wholly from a service provider, uh, a provider that, that I think clearly should be, uh, uh, should clearly have to, to look at the FCC, which is the federal agency charged with, with regulating mobile, with regulating radio and wired telecommunications in this country. Um, so maybe with that, I'll just end and... and um, anybody else before we move on? Jack, Jack you, did, did you? Um, I think uh, I agree with uh, Harold's and, and Joel's uh, read of, of the Comcast decision as being nuanced with respect to 
um, the FCC's uh, authority over, over wireless services. And um, I guess um, I would also point out, uh, as Joel mentioned, that you know, in uh, furtherance of the FCC's national broadband plan, um, there are certainly plenty of areas in which uh, the commission uh, has to 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 make policy to to you know reform communications policy for the way that we're using communication services now and in the future, um, and you know we see that there are lots of areas uh, post Comcast uh, in which the uh, the FCC can can still act. Um, if people have questions and you want to come up, I don't. I, my questions are probably not as good as some in the audience, but I'll ask one to tee up. Uh, hopefully some audience questions. So uh, is there agreement on the panel? There have been a couple cases where um, carriers have or their agents have blocked text messaging campaigns. And in, in a couple of cases, they've kind of reversed that kind of quickly after, after it came to light. But um, is there agreement on the panel that the FCC would be the appropriate authority to um, tell the the carriers whether that was kosher or not. Well, since I filed the petition asking the FCC to do it, I certainly think so. <laughs> um, again, in this context, it's important to distinguish between two things. There's SMS text messaging, and then there's short codes. Um, SMS text messaging is the thing that we all do to each other, which um, I think looks Ex exactly like a telecommunication service and therefore would hope that the FCC um, would uh, just resolve that. Um, you know, we believe that the FCC uh, should uh, uh, likewise exert authority over the short code market uh, because we believe that um, uh, it would, uh, again, just be in the interest of the industry, in the interest of businesses that are trying to use short codes, in the interest of consumers who rely on this, to know where you can go if something like this comes up when you have, as happened recently, where you have the Sprint, the wireless carrier, points to the company in the middle of this, the aggregator, and says, well, it's their issue, and the aggregator points to Sprint and says, no, Sprint told us you know, not to do this, and the people who are relying on the short code are saying, well, but somebody told us they're gonna cut us off uh, at the end of March, and where do we go to get that resolved? Uh, you have to actually have some place where you can go, um, you know, to to have that question answered. I personally think the FCC is set up to handle it. They do this with phone numbers all the time, and at the end of the day, we're not talking about anything that's that much different from a phone number. Anyone else? Um. Our understanding, or my understanding of the uh, of the incident that, that Harold mentions, um, it, you know, it, we think actually is a good example of how uh, some best practices that have been established, not by the carriers specifically, but uh, by the, the carriers as part of a larger group, um, the Mobile Marketing Association, which includes the aggregators and the advertisers, um, identified um, a, a, a misuse um, of codes and. Um, you know, sought to sought to address it, um, and I, I think as as we've talked about in some of the other panels today, uh, as the ecosystem expands beyond uh, you know a very carrier driven and carrier centric use of data and location based services, um, you know there's there's a need, uh, and I think it's it's being it's being uh, addressed um, among you know the, this ecosystem of of expanding out those best practices and, and, and standards to take into account that there are now apps providers there are now aggregators um, you know dealing with these data services we have an audience question yeah oh, if, okay. if I if I may yes um, one of the questions we have the, the last panel was locating your privacy and we didn't address the legislative or regulatory or enforcement aspect of location privacy um, to the extent that you have more app-enabled location-based services um, that, that read location information from a variety of sources that may or may not be tethered to the telecommunications component of the mobile phone, um, whether it be Wi-Fi triangulation, cell phone triangulation, um, and sharing of information, to the extent that the enforcement needs to happen um, or rulemaking needs to happen, um, where, what is the appropriate agency, if at all, um, the Federal Communications Commission or the Federal Trade Commission, and what do you think if 
the House Commerce Committee writes a, a legislative bill on privacy and includes location information as a sensitive piece of information, where do you think that rulemaking authority is going to go? Um, the risk of being the first one to say something. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, we should talk about privacy, I guess, because uh, I think there is an, actually a very good uh, and an important role for the Federal Trade Com Commission to play. Um, so maybe I'll take your first question first and your second question, your second question first and your first question second. Um, if, if there's legislation, um, I, you know, I think from, from, from our perspective, if there's legislation, um, I, I don't know that we've ever advocated for the House to put into legislation what is sensitive information. Um, I think from our perspective, that's something that the FTC could do very well and is an expert agency to look at what actually makes sensitive information in the minds of consumers. Um, so we've asked in, you know, in any legislation that comes forward to just direct that appropriate agency um, to, to enter into a process to, to consider what might be sensitive information, what falls into, into the bucket of, of things that just shouldn't be collected for advertising purposes and falls into the bucket of things that should be, that can be collected but need to still be protected. Um, when it comes to location, I, I mean, I think consumers have a lot of concern when it comes to the way that um, both the providers of networks, which might be more in the FCC territory, and also the aggregators of data based on the use of applications, which might be more in the FTC category. That is dividing out kind of the carriers that transport the information from the applications and the content that collects sometimes data from consumers about how they use that, that information. Um, and I think consumers get that. I think they understand that there's a difference between an application, um, which they can download from an app store, and the company that makes it, and, uh, and the, the company that they pay hundreds of dollars to each month. Um, I think they, they kind of understand that those are two different, two different places, two different companies. Um, so taking the geolocation piece, um, to the extent that it's done through the provider, I think that there are some, some real issues that consumers have. The mobile device as an ad platform um, could be a great tool for commerce, but it could also be, it, you know, it also needs a lot of limits. Um, it also, I think, brings a lot of kind of um, concerns to consumers. With well, a mobile device, you know where people go, you know where they linger, you know um, you know, what store they've been in, you know, um, you know, wh what website they've visited, you know, what they're texting to their friends. Um, it's, it's one of the most intimate devices that a consumer has on their body at all times. And collecting all that information and using it as an ad platform, I think needs to, to have, we need to have a serious discussion um, about what are the limits to collecting that information. And, and there's, I think there's, different levels of concern about who has access to that information, right? I mean, there's concerns about kind of enforcing privacy policies that they're not going to do, give your information to somebody else. There's, there's location-based advertising issues. Um, there are certainly um, concerns about government being able to get a hold of that information as well. So there's different yeah. levels of... Yeah, I think so. And, and I also think, and I'll also just say, um, because we talked about it a little bit in the beginning, that, that um, you know, from, from, from our perspective, when it comes to things like this, the, 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 the old framework of notice and choice is inadequate, or at least the way that it's been implemented so far is inadequate. Uh, one, because there's not, particularly when it comes to cell phones, there's not so much consumer choice, right? It's, you know, use our product and get information collected about you or don't. That's not really a choice when it comes to consumers, particularly with a mobile device um, that connects you with your family that's important for emergency uses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and with regard to notice, notice is no, is, isn't, as it was conceived, giving reasonable, uh, understandable notice to consumers about what information might be collected. It's more of an exercise for lawyers, for the companies that are collecting information to make sure that they're protected under the law if they ever get caught or if their data ever gets breached. Um, so, so, so I think we need to get beyond notice and choice. We need to look at other, other, um, other privacy standards, other fair information practices that, that the FTC uh, could, could, could study and could, could use to inform their decision making. Uh, I think Steve's so, itching to get in here and talk. So we've, we've tossed around over and over again how important it is for people to know where to turn. But if, if that ends up being the guide for setting up a balkanized system of enforcement agencies, well, let's just build people a website where they can just, well, bitch and complain about something to do with the internet or communications, and then we can have a computer program where smart people allocate it to the right place. We shouldn't make that decision going in, that we must maintain this 
somewhat specious distinction between the voice and the data simply because people need to know where to go. But with respect to Tim Lorden's question, answer it in steps. When it comes to geolocation privacy, the first is FTC needs to continue to enforce privacy policies with respect to the clarity and sticking to them. Second, do we need new rules? And if you do, who does them? Um, I'll concede that maybe COPPA, when it comes to kids, needs a little bit of a look when it comes to geolocation. I, have, uh, I use geolocation services for my children on their cell phones, and when I look at COPPA, COPPA covers mobile. The FTC wrote it in there by saying, or other methods of transmission. But COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, probably didn't cover geolocation information that's associated with my kid as personal information. It's probably not in there. I've read it a few times, and I don't think it's there. So given that FTC is doing an update of COPPA, I think it might make sense to make sure that definition is expansive enough to include information like geolocation. And then you ask, well, what if we need new legislation? And the key word is legislation, not necessarily brand new regulations. And that is one of the reasons the FTC really worries me out there on second base, because they're currently seeking brand new authority to, to shed the Magnus and Moss rules from, 70, from 1970s. This would allow uh, a sort of an FTC on steroids, I think Jim Miller called it, to where they could issue new regs without waiting for Congress to authorize it. Think about it. The COPPA rulemaking by the FTC was authorized by a statute. The COPPA statute in 1998 told the FTC, go do this under APA rules and do it quickly. And the FCTC has done that, and I think it's appropriate to take another look to see whether COPPA needs to be improved. But that doesn't mean we need an FTC that can institute de novo rulemakings anytime it wants without having the evidentiary requirements and the court challenges and the protections we put place in the 1970s under Magnus and Moss. Anybody for a lightning round answer before we go to another audience yeah, question? Let me say, one or two quick things. One, the FTC has had a privacy petition in front of it for, I think, two years now. Um, so they're not exactly shining in the we can take responsibility for this stuff uh, department. Um, I will pass on the question of the shell game of we all agree in theory where that there ought to be something, but when we say FCC, then suddenly it should be at the FTC. When we say FTC, suddenly it should be at Congress. Congress can't even pass a spectrum inventory bill. Um, on which was bipartisan uh, and uh, for which there's, uh, um, you know, broad support, um, let alone authorize a complicated rulemaking for every single goddamn thing relating to privacy that we're going to want to see addressed. Finally, I think that different agencies have different specialties. I like the notion, actually, of having one place where consumers can come and have somebody say, what you want is this agency over here. Um, I think that if we're talking about things like, should there be a way to disable geolocation because I personally might want to do that, that's an FCC technical standards issue. If we are talking about what kind of information do we think it's appropriate for an application to protect, um, to collect and report back to the mothership and how do you use that stuff, that to me is much more of an FTC type issue, and I think that there is no reason why we can't have both specificity about what issues go where, carrier and technical issues, FCC, more consumery stuff, FTC, um, and have the agencies use their special expertise in an appropriate way. Audience question. In the interest of uh, full disclosure, my name is Kerry Hinton. I'm with the D.C. Public Service Commission which is going to be a tip-off to where I'm coming from. <laughs> so many of you have said, well, where should people go? FCC, FTC. It's blatantly obvious to me that they should be, as they do now, as, as currently happens every day, when consumers have problems with utility services, they go to the state regulatory commissions, and in some cases, when they have problems with their cable video service, they go to their local franchising authority. They don't go to the FCC. If you just look at the numbers, even though they're reported a year late, but you look at those numbers from the FCC and the number of complaints they actually receive, it's significantly less than any state regulatory commission receives uh, regarding uh, utility services or even one segment of the utility. Secondly, the FCC just keeps a tally. They don't mediate. They've not saved consumers, frankly, one nickel when it comes to an individual billing problem, whereas state regulatory commissions literally save tens of millions of dollars for consumers every year. And I say state regulatory commissions because I know Jackie's organization supports going to the state attorney generals. 
which we all know is forum shopping because state attorney generals will not place individual consumer complaints on a high priority list, whereas the state regulatory commission not only has staff dedicated to it, but as Steve suggested, they have websites that are available for consumers to make online complaints. That will be responded to. Any, any reaction? You to missed that? my earlier shout out to local authority in my uh, opening. Uh, yes, remarks. I did caught that. And you're absolutely right about class auction lawsuits generally don't work. Jackie, any, any response to that one? <laughs> you can pass on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, other, other audience questions? We've got time for it's it's almost 5:30, but we have we've, there's a lot we haven't covered. Um, any other? So I, I'm Baron Soak at the Progress and Freedom Foundation. I want to try to unite the two themes that have been raised today about the FTC and the FCC uh, because I think there is a certain parallel between the Comcast case and the. Uh, CFPA legislation that Steve mentioned that was passed by the House in December that would uh, expand the FTC's uh, both rulemaking and its enforcement authority. And, and, and so my question for, for you, for Harold and for, for Joel in particular, is why, why should we uh, allow regulatory agencies to be untethered from specific uh, grants of authority? And, and, and is, is getting the right result more important than, for example, expecting that the if the FCC asserts its authority to do something that it, and says it's ancillary, that it has to say it's ancillary to something. And your response to that was, well, the court was a very nuanced position. They, they just said the FCC has to come up with another theory, and that's true. But of course, the FCC threw out every theory they could possibly think of, and none of them seemed to provide anything that provided any basis for jurisdiction. And then on the other side, with the FTC, what, what Steve's getting at is, well, we're basically suggesting that from here on out, the F TC, which is the second most powerful legislator, ought to be able to just start any rulemaking it wants over any area, of, any area of the economy, again, untethered from any grant of congressional authority. So doesn't that worry you a little bit that, that you know, a future regulatory agency with, with in either one of those areas might do things that, that, that you don't like? If, it, if, for example, it was run by, say, social conservatives or people that wanted to stop piracy or, or whatever the agenda might be? You put your finger on and the extraordinarily difficult uh, question, which is what do you fear more? Um, and it used to be that we said, Congress makes broad delegations of authorities to expert agencies because Congress is our generalist legislature and they make a very general grant to the expert agency and we trust the expert agency to handle everything. That was where the doctrine of ancillary authority developed in that context when we trusted expert agencies to work in the public interest. Um, Obviously, that didn't always work out. Public choice theory um, you know, points to a number of failures of regulatory agencies of age of regulatory capture. You know, my organization brought the broadcast flag case precisely because you know, the FCC said, well, we feel like using ancillary authority to control um, you know, consumer electronic devices. The flip side, though, is um, do I fear more the concentration of private power and no recourse? Uh, when I you know, look at you know what we have out there now uh, in terms of market concentration and market structure and the ability of individual consumers to negotiate in a hypothetical uh, free marketplace uh, and I look at what happens in preemption such as what happened in the financial service industry where the Comptroller General simply preempted everything and said when lenders compete we win oops turned out there were some negative externalities there um, you know, it raises a great deal of concern one way or the other. I don't have a good right answer for that. I generally tend on the side of Congress makes general grants of authority where those have been uh, uh, deemed to be general grants of authority. Uh, Section 303R of the Communications Act being the classic example of a broad general grant of authority over wireless services. Um, and uh, um, say that, uh, um, you know, what maximizes my chance of getting, uh, of minimizing bad results and of maximizing the likelihood of better results. And at this juncture in time, I think it is um, in the regulatory agencies rather than in a Congress which has demonstrated that it is dysfunctional. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I would say, um, I, I, well, so take FCC first and FTC second maybe. Um, and, and, and broadly across both, I think absolutely there needs to be outward bounds of, of you know, outward boundaries 
of what their authority is, and I think it's important for Congress to enact them. Um, and I was never suggesting that they shouldn't have expressed delegations of authority that, that, that give them um, uh, their power to take action. Um, with FCC, with regard to Comcast's broadband, um, and not to nitpick, but they, they, they actually only offered two, two sections to the court. They only briefed two sections to the court of the Communications Act. The court came back and offered a number of other sections that, that they didn't find persuasive either. Um, but, 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 and this maybe gets into too much of the weeds, um, but you know, I think this gets back to looking at what is broadband. Is broadband an information service that's completely con joined, as the FCC said in 2002, with the data that flows over those, those pipes? Consumers, back in 2002, they got service through an ISP like AOL. They did their IMing within it, they did their chatting within it, their email within it, their browsing within it. Consumers now understand the difference between Facebook or Google or Gmail or Hotmail or Yahoo and their service provider. Um, I think they can, and so, I mean, I think it, 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 it makes sense for the FCC to treat it as such. And Congress, when they passed the 96 Act, um, I, I mean, they weren't dumb. They knew that the Internet existed in 1996. That's why they wrote advanced telecommunication services into the Act several times. Um, so I think it might make sense for the FCC to go back and take a look at uh, how it defines broadband and, and go forward from there in order to do all of the things that it said uh, it, this country should be doing with regard to broadband, expanding the universal service fund to build broadband out to places that the free market doesn't reach, to make sure that, provide, uh, that consumers have free, uh, excuse me, consumers have um, uh, information that's consistent and available to them about speeds of service, cost of service, and other types of quality measures that might help them make a more rational decision in the marketplace, et cetera, et cetera. With regard to the FTC and rulemaking authority, um, I think absolutely Congress should, should paint those, outward, those outer bounds of what, where the FTC should go. We've been actually um, arguing for FTC, for expanded FTC rulemaking authority for, for, for a long time. Um, in our mind, it's not, it's not enough for them to be able to go out and um, punish unfair and deceptive practices, they should actually be able to say what are unfair and deceptive practices uh, and put rules in place that, that are common rules of the road that, take, that provide some consistency to the marketplace and give indications to both consumers and providers of goods and services uh, what's, what's, what's in bounds and what's out of bounds. For a long time, the FTC was uh, at the forefront of calling for regulators in the federal government to get in front of the, the, financial, uh, the financial meltdown and mortgage in, the, in what we soon saw as a meltdown in the mortgage industry. Um, that, that's because they, they couldn't make rules with regard to subprime lenders. Um, uh, so I'll stop there, but I'll say yeah. that, that I think it's important for Congress to give an indication to those agencies, but absolutely it should be the expert federal agency with expertise with staff devoted to protecting consumers that should be making the day-to-day -day decisions that help protect consumers from the problems that they face in the marketplace. We're, we're cutting into um, cocktail yeah. and, and hors d'oeuvre time, and, and Tim wants me to remind everyone that we're next door, and you're all invited to stay and continue your conversations there. Um, I'm gonna ask kind of one more question and ask for people to, to do a quick wrap-up if, if they want to as well, and just go down the line, or maybe start with Danny and come this way. Um, but if uh, there were one thing that you would like to see either the FTC or the FCC or Congress or some other agency do in terms of consumer protection for um, mobile subscribers, what would it be? And if you have any other final thoughts, go ahead. Uh, since I just announced our NOI, I'm gonna, gonna uh, hide under that a little bit and say that we're at the point of asking questions, not providing answers, but I will tell you the kinds of answers that we feel we really need to hear from all of you. Uh, I'm not sure how comfortable I am uh, separated off the mobile environment as a completely separate animal uh, uh, from, from anything else. Uh, obviously, there are times when it's appropriate to do that, but, but I think when, when both um, consumers and, and innovators in this country look uh, out at the internet environment, what they see is the internet environment. Uh, that is the platform that innovation happens on, both, both commercial innovation and social and political innovation. And I think the challenge that we all face is to find 
uh, an approach to that environment based on what we've learned uh, over the last 10 or 15 years of, of addressing it uh, that, that really provides uh, the, the, the kind of right combination of, of, of flexibility uh, for innovators and protections and certainty for, for, for consumers. So um, that's, the, that's the framework that, that we're looking to try to, 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 to try to contribute to. I'm not going to tell at this point any particular uh, part of the government what they ought or ought not to do, but I think that's the kind of question that, that we all ought to be asking. I think our um, our wish is for the uh, for the FCC as it as it moves forward with the broadband plan and with uh, with uh, addressing some of the issues that come out of the Comcast case to continue to be data driven uh, and to continue to to keep a, a close eye toward um, innovation and uh, how their uh, how their policies uh, impact and or hopefully um, enable that innovation. help consumers make more rational decisions in the marketplace by requiring disclosure of more truthful information about services, speeds, and price. Um, have carriers justify early termination fees by linking them to the cost of the handset that they're subsidizing for consumers and help lower barriers to entry so more uh, competitors can, in, can get into the marketplace and offer service by making Spectrum available to some of the smaller players, uh, doing away with handset exclusivity and making it easier for consumers to switch providers. Um, well, I'm tempted to say open up more unlicensed Spectrum, but uh, um, the, yeah, my short answer is I think the FCC ought to recognize that uh, all of these services, voice, text, um, and, uh, inf and uh, data, our Title II telecommunication services, they ought to just say up front, we're applying the 201, 202 standard of just and reasonable, um, and if the industry can work it out through self-regulation, then we'll bless that as just and reasonable. Um, if advertising works for the publishing of rates or whatever you know that's required, which the FCC does in some situations already, um, then that's fine, but doing that creates a necessary safety net for what has become the critical infrastructure of the 21st century. Steve. Thanks. Grant, you asked for our one wish uh, for regulating the wireless, the mobile space. And, and it would be this, that any rigs that are done focus on conduct and not technology. When we regulate specific technologies, we inevitably fall behind the evolution of innovation, and we end up having, well, meetings like this to decide how we have to change and update the regs. What, what a shame it'll be if two years from today we have to have these same series of meetings because the wireless world has moved from 3G to 4G, and now all voice is really just data. And so we end up with the same conversations again. Don't regulate technologies, regulate the conduct. And it would be independent of the technologies used. And I close by saying that even 200 years ago, we kind of got it right when in Salem, Massachusetts, they were conducting the witch trials. Their methods were a bit, 300 years ago, Harold tells me, so it's even longer. But their, their methods were a bit strange, but they, what they pursued with respect to witches was behavior. They pursued the bad behavior that they perceived witches were doing. But had they regulated technology instead, one wonders how could they have ever told the household brooms from the getaway vehicles? I can't never help. Work. I can't help but be amused because the term for the evidence they admitted was spectral evidence. Spectral <laughs> <laughs> uh, Exactly. I, I think that's the end. Uh, th thanks for sticking around. <laughs>